I call the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I'm pleased that we dispensed with the Outlawries Bill, which will ensure that we have civility and freedom of speech in this chamber, and I intend to adhere by the civility part of it. It's up to others to decide on the freedom of speech. Um, Mr Speaker, July will mark the centenary of the Battle of the Somme, an episode of frankly needless carnage and horror. This week marked the centenary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, where Britain and France divided up the Ottoman Empire into spheres of influence, arbitrarily establishing borders that have frankly been the cause of many conflicts ever since. These two events should remind us in this House of two things. Firstly, that decisions we take have consequences, and it's our armed forces that face the consequences of failed foreign and military policy. Our duty to our armed forces is to avoid the political mistakes that lead them to being sent unnecessarily into harm's way. And as the member for Bracknell pointed out, the effects of war go on for the whole lifetime of those that have taken part in it. By tradition, Mr Speaker, at the beginning of each parliamentary session, we commemorate members of the House who we've, who we've lost in the last year. In October, we lost Michael Meacher. He was, as all who met him knew, a decent, hard-working, passionate and very profound man. He represented his constituency with diligence and distinction for 45 years. He was a brilliant environment minister and a lifelong campaigner against injustice and poverty and a brilliant champion of the rights of this House and of Parliament. We remember Michael for all of those things. Yeah. Harry Harpham, sadly, had only a few months to serve this House. He represented his constituency and the concerns of the steel industry in Sheffield with incredible diligence. My honourable friend and the new member for Sheffield, Brightside and Hillsborough now represents that same constituency. As she told me at his passing, We've admired the bravery and courage he showed in his life, which was formed during the miners' strike and carried him forward for the rest of his life. Harry and Michael were both incredibly decent, honourable men, absolutely dedicated to serving their communities and standing up for strong socialist principles. We commemorate both of them. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I would like to congratulate the mover and seconder on the Queen's speech. It's a job I've never had to do myself. <laughs> It's one of those powers of patronage. <laughs> Firstly, I want to congratulate the Right Honourable Member for Meriden on her excellent speech, which I attribute to her the excellent training she received early in her career. Now, it's possible that many members of her own side are unaware that Sister Spellman, or Comrade Spellman, was, like me, a full-time union official before entering Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> because, Mr Speaker, while industrial strife raged across the country during the early 1980s, I was part of it, the Right Honourable Member... Wait, 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 wait. They're just too fast, Mr Speaker. The Right Honourable Member was travelling the whole country defending sugar beet workers from disreputable and exploitative bosses. At least that's what I think the National Farmers Union was doing at that time. But alas, time changes things and the Right Honourable Member and I now sing from a slightly different hymn sheet. Talking of which, Mr Speaker, I understand that she's been a stalwart of the Parliamentary Choir for many years. Perhaps she will find time to give me some singing lessons. Given her background, perhaps together we could sing the Red Flag as a duet. <laughs> or both. The Right Honourable... We'll, we'll sing from the widest hymn sheet, don't you worry. The Right Honourable Member, Mr Speaker, has, excellent, has an excellent reputation for her outstanding work in international development, both in opposition and then in government. She steered her party 
some ungraciously might say kicking and screaming into delivering the pledge that 0.7% of our GDP would be spent on international aid. And I pay a huge tribute to her for the way in which she championed the rights of women and young girls in the developing world. She stood up for their needs, their rights and ensured that our aid budget did go correctly and disproportionately to help women and young girls in the developing world and I thank her for that. I think underneath it all, she's a bit of a closet radical, actually. <laughs> so we'll talk later. <laughs> and I have to say, Mr. S uh, Mr. Speaker, after some research, I can exclusively reveal to the House the roots of her radicalism. Because uh, her constituency includes the town of Dorridge, and the waters of Dorridge are very important. In the early 18th century, long before the Right Honourable Member was elected, I should add, her, constitu <laughs> her constituency was a nest of rebellion and sedition, and it was led by a local landowner, George Frederick Muntz. A refugee, Muntz was one of, refugee Muntz was one of the founders of the Birmingham Political Union an organisation that was pivotal to the introduction of the 1832 Reform Act and the Union later became part of the Chartist movement on which we trace the origins of socialism in this country and the Labour Party and naturally I hugely admire the Birmingham Political Union for what it did. A member of the Parliamentary Choir, the Right Honourable Member, was in fine voice today and I'm sure the whole House will join me in thanking her for her speech today. I now turn, Mr Speaker, to the seconder of the Loyal Address, the Honourable Member for Bracknell. Before joining the House, the Honourable Member worked as a doctor. Today, he's lanced the myth that doctors are bad communicators. In his maiden speech, the Honourable Member said, I'm often asked why I moved away from being a doctor to being a Member of Parliament. To my mind, people who come in here should want to make this country a better place. Myself and Honourable Members come from absolutely opposite sides of the political spectrum, but we're both sincere in sharing the same goal, to make our country a better place for those that live here. Researching the Member's career, I thought I'd uncovered yet more evidence of the very deep fractures that exist within the Government today. Because I was informed that he was a leading member of an organisation known as the Grumblers. <laughs> However, further research, and we've been into this in some detail, indicated this was not another group of malcontents on the government backbenches, that's already full, but a cricket club of which the Honourable Member would have us believe he's a leading light. So I didn't want to leave any of this research undone. So I approached the club to get a sense of the character of the Honourable Member before making today's speech. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah, it's definitely coming. So I think the whole House will be eternally grateful, Mr Speaker, to the words of Mr Anton Joyner, who's the chairman of the Old Grumblers Cricket Club, for his very insightful and very helpful response to my request. And he wrote, and if I may quote the letter from uh, Mr Joyner, I'm sure the House will all be the better informed for this. Dear Sir, we are glad you have established contact with our team. We are desperately seeking recovery of several seasons overdue match fees by our <laughs> honourable friend. <laughs> Please communicate our willingness to waive penalty interest in return for prompt payment. <laughs> and it goes on in an undistinguished and tragically all too long career as a, top, as a top order batsman, the good doctor managed an average of just 11.2 runs with the bat. However, his efforts with the ball yielded a solitary wicket, that of the wife of a French farmer <laughs> during a tour match in Brittany in 2008. And the generosity of the member knew no bounds, and as a doctor, 
uh, Mr Lee advised on numerous sporting injuries to club players. And the letter goes on to say, the misdiagnosis of many led to a string <laughs> of unnecessary, unnecessary early retirements and, a, and an acute player availability crisis <laughs> from which the team has only recently recovered. <laughs> As captain of the old Grumblers Cricket Club, I rarely had to handle as obstinate and disruptive a character as the doctor, <laughs> who stubbornly refused to stand in any conventional field placement and very openly demonstrated a disdain for team sports, command structures. And presumably, this led him to the logical career choice of Tory backbencher. <laughs> Please, and the letter concludes, Please pass on my regards and the attached invoice. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I very much hope the Honourable Member is a good sport, as I understand he's an equally distinguished rugby player. <laughs> But those stories were beyond my research capabilities and must be saved for another occasion. I thank him for his more acceptable exploits in the House today. Yeah.